us today. Right. Welcome to the Caribbean Edge. We are here to talk about a very important topic, human trafficking, which impacts all of us, regardless if it's directly or indirectly. And we welcome this evening, um, State Attorney Catherine fernandez Rundle. Welcome. Thank you for your time this evening with us. How are you? Thank you, so I'm great. Thank you so much. And uh, I wanna thank you, Don, and, and the Caribbean Edge for talking about a very important issue, inviting me to be part of that conversation and to get the message out that is super important, as you said, to all of us directly and indirectly, you're absolutely right. Um, and it is a power, it's a powerful time to do it as well, which I'm sure that's why you chose it, Don, is because this is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. So I thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. And yes, exactly why we chose it. Every day it's important. Um, because it's impacting kids' lives more specifically. And a lot of us, I believe, included myself, live in a bubble. I won't exclude myself from it. So unless you specifically go out and research it or these conversations take place or you're working in that field directly, you're not necessarily aware of it until it happens, until someone brings it to your doorstep. And it's just because our children are so vulnerable and we need to have the conversations just for awareness alone can definitely impact us. So my first question to you is what is human trafficking? Mm -hmm. You know, on the, oh, you are so right when you're saying that we just don't, I always say, if we're not looking for human trafficking, we're not gonna see human trafficking. And it is an ugly crime. It does tend to happen in our alleyways in the dark shadows. And so we've been trying to put a bright light on it. And I, I think that just what you described on is the way I kind of was about eight years ago. I thought I knew what human trafficking was, but I was wrong. I had conjured up this image in my mind when someone said human trafficking, some of the things we've seen in the movies and, uh, you know, trapped. And, 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 and there is some of that, but that's not really our experience here. So uh, I thought it was children being kidnapped in the Philippines or somewhere in Southeast Asia and then being transported to Central and South America in cargo container ships. And I, I just was, couldn't have been wrong, more wrong. Those are myths for us. That's not to say other countries don't have that experience, but for Miami-Dade County, that's not our experience. In 2012, show you my journey a little bit, Dawn. We, um, Florida ranked, there is a national database. There's a global database and a national database. And the, the national database actually documented where in the United States were the highest, uh, I I highest volume of victims. And Florida ranked number one, I'm sorry, number three, at that time it was actually number two, number three in the country in the number of victims of human trafficking. And of course, Miami, as much as we love Miami, is number one in so many ways. Unfortunately, that's not where we want to be, number one. We were number one in Florida. So it, that began my journey to begin to learn what is human trafficking. Human trafficking is modern day slavery. It comes in a variety of different forms, but primarily there are two types. There's the sexual exploitation, side of it, which is the one we tend to think of a lot, or more of, or at least um, I think that's where our expertise is. And I'll talk about that in a second. And then there's the labor trafficking, taking advantage of domestics, working them in the fields and our agricultural um, fields here in Florida. Our agriculture is uh, still one of our, that and tourism are two greatest revenue sources as a state. So um, there's, there's that aspect of it. And that happens to a lot of our immigrant, immigrant population. They don't, have, they don't have access, they don't have visas, they get trapped, they don't get paid, they can't get out. Uh, they have family here, they have a child here, and they, you know, they just get deeper and deeper into the labor trafficking. Traditionally, the federal government, you know, the US Marshals, Homeland Security, US Attorney's Office, 
they tend to have a better expertise in labor trafficking um, than our office does. Our office, and we do labor trafficking, I'll give you some examples, but what we've really focused on, I guess, is because that's where the crimes took us, that's where the victims took us, was in the sexual exploitation piece. And there are a number of different ways it happens, but essentially it's when you exploit somebody, either because of their age or because of their vulnerability, uh, certainly because of their gender, and gender is a, a big piece of it, and you sell them or manipulate them or lure them into sexual encounters primarily for money. And it, I will tell you, I was floored when I learned that this is about money and it's about selling our children and our youth for sex. It's a $150 billion industry worldwide and a $32 billion industry in the United States. This is one of the challenges that we have because with that huge demand, that's a big, that's a big industry if you think about it. So we've been chipping away at it here. And what our experience is, is that these are our children. They're in our schools, they're in our parks, they're in our foster care system as a, as a large source, unfortunately, for these victims. We know that demographically, when I tell you this, Don, and, and your listeners, I mean, I'm sure it's gonna grab your heart like it does mine. The young, we've had victims as young as 12 years old, 12. And the, at the 35% of the victims that we've encountered since 2012, 13, when I told you we began this journey, we are 35% are under the age of 18. And the remaining 65% is 18 to 24. So you're really talking about children and our youth because it's between, you know, 13 and 24 years old. Yeah. And I've watched some of the videos and they've brought me to tears just to listen to some of the stories of a lot of the victims and you know how they were persuaded some of them are just normal relationships you fall in love with someone this is for our young girls falling in love at a high school level and thinking this person is for you they move you to a different state away from your family and then they start selling you out for sex and and this is someone you trusted and loved and then you're too embarrassed to call home to your parents so for me, it struck home to say, you know, the parents' involvement in how we are speaking and having these conversations early with our children, just to say, there's nothing you can do that will make me not be there for you for the rest of your life. So that's coming from a mom's perspective when I, when I listen to a lot of this, because I can put my own kids in that position and say, wow, they could move out of state and be in trouble. And I not know because they're too ashamed or too embarrassed to call me because they've been victimized mentally and physically. So, and I understand as well with the internet, social media, um, it's like quadrupled um, the volume of how easy it is for them to access our youth. So parents really have to pay attention to that as well. Are you seeing that? Yes, you're absolutely right. You really capsulize that very well because one of the things, so we, we know that most of the time the victims are runaways or throwaways. A lot of it is because they're fleeing something in their own household, okay? Maybe mom's new boyfriend, mom's new husband, grandfather, uncle. And I say that because it's general, about 95% of the victims are females and a lot of this stuff happens in the household when they reach puberty. Inappropriate activity starts with an older male in the house. It be an uncle, it could be a cousin, uh, we've seen it all, unfortunately. And they're either, a couple of things happen. Either they don't want to tell mom because they think mom's going to, um, it's going to rock her world, right? Her financial situation. This is her new whatever in the house and she doesn't want to rock the boat for mom. And it's the first time they've had a house maybe. You know, there's all kinds of dynamics. 
Then the other time is sometimes moms don't believe them, by the way. Mm-hmm. If you can imagine, we've had victims say, I tried to tell mom, but she didn't believe me. She was so in love with him. She never thought he would do that. And then there's the shame. That's the larger one that you mentioned. The shame yeah. factor is huge. And they don't want to tell mom because they're afraid of what I just said, right? What ramifications it might have. But also she's just so ashamed. She's, she doesn't see herself as a victim. Yeah. She sees herself as something's wrong. And I don't want to disappoint mommy, especially mommy. Yeah. So, and I'll give you a prime example. The example that you use, uh, we call it the Romeo. So a lot of the girls, they're fleeing home. And, and maybe it's not just, it could be just abuse, neglect. They're looking for love. Dad left, divorce. There's all kinds of things that happen in young people's lives. And sometimes those girls will go couch to couch. Have you heard that Mm -hmm. phrase or couching is another phrase they use. And then, I mean, I had this really sad case. So this one girl, she was uh, 16 years old. She left her mother's house because of her boyfriend and went to live with her grandmother. And she wasn't safe. She did some, she was sad. She was looking for something. So she ran away from grandmother kept asking questions. Why are you here? Why don't you go home? That kind of stuff. So she went to her girlfriend's house. The girlfriend's mother, so this is why this is why it takes a village, right? We all have to be mindful. Mm-hmm. So she was sleeping on the couch at her girlfriend's house. And finally the mother looked at her and didn't had no idea she was going to be hurting this little girl. She said, you know, I think it's time for you to go home. You know, she'd been there, you know, an extended period of time. And so the little girl didn't know what to do. And her girlfriend said to her, you know, my boyfriend has an apartment with his brother. I'll see if you can stay there. And that was the beginning of a nightmare for her. She, uh, she went to go stay with the boyfriend, the girl's boyfriend. And immediately the two boys raped her. They threw her in a car. And this is right down south here, uh, in the su- southern, you know, sort of, near the uh, South Lake US one, and I won't give you the address because it's a hotel we all know actually. And uh, she, she was locked in a car, taken to a gas station and was forced to perform sex on some of the people that came in and out of the gas station for dollars. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Then they took her to a local uh, motel, not a hotel. And from 6 a.m., I'm sorry, from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., they had 25 men coming and going, raping that young child, 16 years old. It so was, that's, sorry? That's just disturbing, right? And so then disturbing. I want to segue into what you're saying now. So you have these 25 men, you know, I want to know, like, how are we holding them accountable? Are the laws yeah. strict enough for some of these men, maybe just passing through a truck stop or gas station, but some of the men involved with with victimizing these young girls and boys are doctors and lawyers, and are the laws strong enough to enforce it? Okay, so um, there's so many different people that need to be held accountable, right? Yeah. And Don, what we've learned is we're prosecutors. And so tr- our traditional approach has been, somebody comes up, puts a gun in your face, says, Don, give me your purse or takes your car. You're gonna say, that's the person who did it. That's the person who did it to me. I recognize him, this is what he said, and this is what he took. And that's essentially a case, right? These cases, these cases are primary focuses on the victim. And oftentimes it's, too, it's very traumatic for the victim to A, remember exactly who did what to her and where and when and how, because the neuroscience is you want to suppress that. Yeah. And then the second piece of that is it sets off triggers as well. So I tell you all that. So we're very mindful of these victims. They're, they're young and they've been deeply traumatized. That's number one. Number two, they're the pimps and the predators. So what we want to do is prosecutors, we want to get them off the street. And so they can't do this to the next vulnerable little person that comes along. 
And when I say little, I, I mean young, young person that comes along because they're vulnerable and they have vulnerabilities because of their whatever that's going on in their life, right? That caused them to hit the street in the first place. And then there's the demand side. These guys are selling these young people because they're buyers, which is what you're sort of talking about, right? Mm -hmm. The demand side, which is the real, real challenge. So let me see if I can go back to those three groupings. So the victim is number one for us. Getting the predator is right there just underneath that. We, we, we try to make decisions that won't hurt our victim anymore. So sometimes we do compromise on the types of charges. We've also become very creative, by the way. Mm -hmm. You mentioned social media. Social media is, you know, it's, it's a gift and a curse, right? So it's one way in which they sell a lot of, a lot of our victims but it's also a way we find them. And it's also a way we can track them back. It's also mm -hmm. a way that we can do undercover operations in terms of, I don't want to get too detailed, but you know, where we will pretend to be a John and we'll end up at the hotel, meaning mm -hmm. one of our task force members. So, and then identification helps, right? We have a picture of her, we have a picture of maybe of them. So uh, we, use, we use untraditional approaches of evidence. Cell phones, text messages are a huge assistance to us. And you were talking about lure, they think they're in love. We actually had a case on where um, we found we, the, the girl changed her mind. And that happens, that happens. She, when she sees the man who she thinks she's in love with, standing in the courtroom, looking at her, they sometimes freeze, flight, you know, flight, freeze, I'm sure you've heard those phrases. And in this case, right in front of the jury and everybody said, oh, he never hurt me, I, I love him, he loves me. So we had to stop the trial for a little while, but fortunately the prosecutor, I'm so proud of her, she had recorded all the text messages and we were able to play and show the text messages to the jurors they came back and convicted him within two hours so i use that as another means of of evidence that we can use so we've gotten much better as experts in this area we've also developed a model for the rest of the country and prosecutors from all over the country have come to miami last january pre-covid we had the national conference for human trafficking for um, prosecutors all over the country, because we have learned a lot. And so that you know, and I would invite you when COVID is over to come see, I believe it's the first and only one of its kind, a human trafficking center and the human, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. It's devoted just to human trafficking. And we have investigators there. I wanna thank my police departments that give us detectives and they're co-located with us uh, at the center, case specialists, care, I call them care connectors. So let's say it's three o'clock in the morning and we get a call, uh, we have a rapid response team, we have a hotline and we get a call, uh, our team goes out to the scene, say at three o'clock in the morning, we rescue her. We take her there, she can shower, she can calm down a little bit because you know they're so, it's horrible, they're tortured. They're drugged, beaten, they're threatened, they're tattooed. Um, so, you know, they go there and then we begin the process of how do we connect them. So if you have listeners, by the way, that wanna help, toiletries, women's clothing, shoes, towels, robes, all of those things would be very helpful for them because they come basically with nothing. But so that center I would want you to come to, what we're now working on, and it's pretty, it's in its embryonic stages is the demand side. So now we've sort of, I don't wanna say conquered, but we've certainly mastered uh, what we needed to do for the victims in terms of neuroscience, in terms of, of creating a safety net of services. We have a policy institute, we have stronger laws. We're constantly training police what to look for, what are the signs. We're constantly talking to hospital first responders, school system curriculums. What are you looking for? How do you spot it? What do you see? What, what, how do, what do I do if I think maybe? 
right? All those questions. And now the demand side is the real challenge. So we're trying two things. One is Florida passed something that's tremendous. It allows us to put the names up of the Johns in big, bold letters if we want. And I tell you this, that uh, police will tell you in our experiences, one of the first things that John says, they get, let's say they're doing an undercover sting and you know, a man thinks he's gonna have a private time with someone for whatever it is, is, $1,500. Next thing he's busted, he goes to jail. The first thing they usually ask, is my wife gonna find out about this? Is my boss gonna find out about this? So unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your view, shame can have a factor on that side of it too, right? So Florida passed a law where those names can be exposed. And I wish I could have shown you one of the billboards that we did right before the Super Bowl. And we put it, we said, buy sex, be exposed. And oh. we had a picture, I know, had a picture of a man. You could be up there on that billboard. So that's one thing. I know it may sound a little um, dramatic, but we'll do whatever we need to do, right? To stop. I it. think they need to be shamed. I, I think, you know, it, it's it, to me, it's awesome if I'm a wife and my husband is buying sex from my, especially from minors, put his name on blast, put it out there. And I'm, I'm contacting your office to get a picture of that billboard <laughs> so I can put it in, in, in our page as well. They need to be exposed. I mean, some of these men have daughters and sons of their own. And to be out there doing it to other young children, uh, put them everywhere. I'll share it. <laughs> you know, I will send it to you, but you just hit on a key thing. So we, you just, you're so smart, Don, because one of the things that the other second thing we're doing other than the, the shame exposure thing is we wanted, so we started something with Dr. Bello. Have you heard of Dr. Bello? Uh, we started something with Dr. Bello. And she had been, she's a survivor and she's brilliant. So we came up with, if, you, if a man gets arrested for prostitution, for being solicitation of prostitution, he goes through the, the county court system. We, he only just paid something, you know, made a contribution, got, nothing really happened. Now we tried a pilot project this year where if we can do what you just said, if we can convince those men how they are being part of human trafficking, this is how you are contributing to this modern day slavery. You don't see it that way. Let us show you how and why you are. And then appeal to them sort of, do you have children? Do you have a young sister, right? Do you have a daughter, a, a niece? I mean, there's so many different ways if we can make them understand so we're gonna try that and see if that, what kind of power that brings to ending the demand side. Yeah, um, I, 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 I'm glad we're having this conversation because one of the other questions I have for you is how do we detect human trafficking? Yeah, so there, it, it's a good question and it's been something that I've been learning about as I shared with you, my team and I, and by the way, I have the best team in America. They are the best team. Um, but, uh, okay, so on, so they're actually very similar for the labor and the sexual, the sexual exploitation one is slightly easier to detect in some ways. Uh, so the first thing would be is if you know the person and you see a complete change and affectation, right? Sadness, sense of isolation, non-communicative, not going to school regularly, missing days of school, um, Dress has suddenly changed, their, their whole clothing has changed, maybe a little more provocative. Uh, if they're with an older male that seems to be in control, he does all the talking, she doesn't speak for herself. Lack of uh, driver's license, passports, things like that. That's one of the first things they do. They steal your, they don't steal it, they just take away your identity. Um, Tattoos, now I know tattoos are a popular form of fashion these days, so I'm not making a comment about tattoos, 
but they can be. Uh, a lot of the predators, a lot of the pimps brand their uh, victims and their girls. Sometimes uh, we, we found, um, do you remember that case of the 13 year old? Or just, 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 I'm gonna bring it up real quick. I don't know how much, how much more time we have, but 13 year old ran away from home for all some of the reasons we talked about, right? She goes to the flea market. She's kind of on her own, looks very sad. Predators know exactly. This guy meets her, makes her fall, you know, come on, I'll take care of you. I'll, you poor thing, come with me, get some roses. And before you know it, she falls in love with him. And before you know it, he's forcing her to have sex. Remember, she's 15 years old. And uh, he then starts selling her. He makes her work night, makes her work the streets, puts her on back page, does all kinds of things. She tries to run away. She escapes time and again. Every time she does, he beats her. He'll send six men in at once to punish her. Then one night she came home without any money. He was furious with her and took her. She's trying to escape that same night. He took her to a tattoo shop. She's 15. I'm sorry, she's 13 years old. She's 13 years old and tattoos on her eyelids. Do you remember seeing this in the newspaper, Don? On her eyelids. Is she 13? Yes, yeah, she's 13. I want to make sure I got the age right, which is unimaginable to me. On her eyelids. Can you imagine the torture? He puts his brand on her. And we found another woman. I think it was Suave was his brand. And the other woman had the same thing on her neck, Suave. So I use that for example for a couple of reasons, right? The luring, the falling in love, the torture, the selling her out, the branding, the tattooing. She's isolated. She keeps trying to run away and can't get away. Those are the, some of the things we, we can look for. Um, we also know that they recruit a lot, the predators in our foster care system. Mm -hmm. So we, all of us, you know, children in the foster care system because they got tough lives already. And these predators know that. And they sometimes, our young people will do anything for a cell phone, right? It's just something simple as a cell phone. And so we had one woman in a foster care home. She was, she was listening and she heard one of the girls say, oh yeah, I can get you, I can get you a phone. You want a phone? I can get you one. What do I have to do? Oh, no big deal. We meet with these men, we have sex and they'll give you a phone. The recruiters had started, there were four of them. They'd recruited a, a bunch of girls in, within the foster care system. And it was that one woman in that, in that therapeutic home, the foster care home that heard it and she called the authorities and we were able to rescue them. That's why awareness shows like what you're doing through Caribbean Edge and getting the message out and getting the word out is so critical because we all have to be. And one last thing, a lot of people say, well, I don't want to pick up the phone and make a phone call. I don't know. You know I don't know if I want to get involved. Um, and I understand that. Um, but you know what? Don't worry about it because let us decide, right? Let the experts, let the police officers, the detectives, the care connectors, let us decide whether or not there's somebody there that needs to be rescued. If you can save a life, our, the cell phone hot, we, the hotline number is 305-FIX-STOP. You can go to our website uh, and look it up. And we have a whole page just on human trafficking. It talks about services, hotline numbers. Um, and you can leave it anonymously, 24 seven. Um, there's somebody here, I'll give you the exact number, Dawn, if you like, yes. for 305 fixed stop is 305-349-7867. You can go to humantrafficking.miamisao.com. And what I always say, Dawn, to your point is, you know, we need a million eyes and a million ears to say, our children and to save our youth. Yeah. And I know a lot of kids went into the foster care system um, because a lot of people were being deported as well. 
And I have a friend who has been on this show as well. She actually, you know, was able to save one child um, and bring her into her home. It was a friend of theirs and she's raising the, the child um, because her mom was deported. And where, you know, we had the conversation to say, what if she didn't take that kid? Because she said no one even followed up with her to say, how is, how is the baby doing? And this is a baby that couldn't even walk. And so it, it, as I hear you speaking about it, I just can't imagine all those kids, that, additional kids that went into the foster care system and becoming part of it, knowing that a huge part of foster kids is where the tar they're targeted because yeah. they're already going through so much, as you said. So um, once again, I want to read that number to the viewers. It's the 305-349-7867. And like you mentioned, you don't, you know, make the call. It's better to save someone's lives and make a mistake if that's not the case of what's going on than not to make the call. And, and, and some of these kids end up dead as well. Some of yeah. these young women I read already have children. And so their kids are also held as a resource for the pimps. And the pimps we know back in the days are the ones with the feathers in the hats and everything. They're normal people just like any guy you'll see on yeah. the street. Yes. Yes. And you know, it's interesting you mentioned the immigration population because uh, I want to share a story of courage. Maybe we'll close on a positive note. But um, there is a woman who, uh, remember we talked about agriculture working in the fields. So I think this was a couple, this case was about two years old. And this was a case where a mother came with her daughter and they came to work the fields. Their immigration status was highly questionable. What the mother really wanted was her daughter to get an education. I think they came from Guatemala, I'm one of the Central American countries, and the little girl was not gonna get the education that her mother wanted her to get. So this mother bravely came here, went to work in the fields. She went into a, like a group home, a home where everybody worked in the fields and they would rent a room type thing. And I believe her daughter was 15 years old. And the daughter ended up working in the fields. They went to church of all places on Sundays. And the predator found them in church, convinced the mother that he could get, he was uh, you know, a landowner and he could promise he could get her daughter the, the life, the education. And so just have her come with me and I'll take care of her. I'll get her into a good school. My home is blah, blah, blah. He sold her all of this and she wanted to believe. And he, they found him in church, wow. you know? So she thought he was a man of faith. He takes the little girl, immediately rapes her when he gets to the house. He puts her out in the field. This is a combination of labor trafficking and sexual trafficking. Makes her work during the day in the fields. And then at night, has, forces her to have sex. She tried to escape many times, she couldn't. Then one day, she's out in the field where he has her working and she sees her mother across the field and she makes a beeline. She runs with all her might to the other side of the field and her mother sees the daughter. It just, you know, it was, oh my God, what's the matter? And picks her up, loves her, raises her. And now she's got a tough decision. She goes back to the group home. I found my daughter, she's safe, I'm so happy. The daughter tells her what happens. She shares it with the other adults that, that are in that group home. And what do I do? Do I just move on? Do I go to the authorities and tell them what happened to my daughter and put her through that? Do I lose my immigration status? Well, I'm gonna get kicked out? It was a really courageous decision she called the authorities. She said, I don't want this to happen to anybody else's little girl. And the courage of that woman, I mean, I, I truly, I'm moved by that. And so you can see the kinds of decisions. Now, maybe somebody would have seen that little girl and not known and maybe made a phone call. But our immigration, any vulnerability, that's what the predators 
where it's immigration status, it's age, foster care, you're neglected. That's what they're looking for is vulnerabilities. Thank you. And thank you for sharing that story with us as well and ending on a good note and making choices, sometimes very difficult choices. We certainly appreciate your time this evening with us once again. And anything else you'd like to add to tonight's conversation? Just to thank you very much and to say that uh, I'm very proud to be, I love Miami Bay County. Mm -hmm. I've been asked to go to many different places to do different things. We are very collaborative as a community. We can overcome a lot of challenges. Uh, we've worked together on human trafficking. We're gonna work together on COVID. We're gonna get through this difficult time in our history, uh, you know, both in criminal justice systems and social justice systems. And we have a lot of work to do, but together and with, you know, people such as yourself, Don, and the people that are listening, we will get through all this and we're gonna do it together. So thank you very much for allowing me to come and communicate with you tonight. Thank you. And we certainly will. Please remember to share this episode. We want to thank attorney Catherine fernandez Rundle and her magnificent team <laughs> for all the hard work, all the police officers, everyone that works behind the scene to bring people to justice, um, for every person that's picked up the phone and rescued someone, um, for people that are out there um, buying young children and taking advantage of them. We hope you see this episode and that it makes a difference. Um, in You have daughters, you have sons, you have nieces, granddaughters. Please don't let this happen to anyone else if you can stop it. Thanks again, and thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody.